Well, hello again, everyone, once again to the Tiger Club Zoom call. It is Tuesday, November 16th. Our guest today will be a regular visitor of the Tiger Club, Dennis Dodd from CBS Sports. Uh, again, we want to remind you the Tiger Club Board of Directors is looking into resuming in-person luncheons sometime after the first of the new year. Please check our website at kctigerclub.com or follow us on Twitter at KC Tiger Club for updates on this. Also, our uh, club's tickets for the Florida game this weekend and Bunker Club passes are available. If you're interested, please send an email to president at kctigerclub.com. Uh, also, I want to thank Darren Weidick for setting up our calls each week on the Zoom. He's done a great job of that. And Paul Blackman, Barry Canner, Dave Tyson for uh, getting our speakers. Let's go to Dennis. Dennis, I know you're on a little bit of a tight schedule, so we'll get right to it. Um, I'm glad we're talking football today and not basketball. So let's talk a lot of football. Um, Tigers <laughs> had a good win on uh, Saturday against South Carolina. and maybe the best defensive effort of the season for them. Uh, it's hard to believe, but there's a chance to beat Florida and go to a bowl game, bowl game this weekend. Yeah, there's all kinds of intrigue at Florida. Um, and there they come in as wounded Gators, uh, obviously with Dan Mullen and the defensive problems there and having fired their defensive coordinator in problems, you know, off the field at Florida. I think they're very gettable. Uh, this is a team that, Less than a year ago, came within a touchdown of beating Alabama in the SEC title game. In the second game of the season, they lost by two to Alabama. Um, and, the, you know, the bottoms just dropped out lately. So, you know, giving up 42 points in one half to Samford, not Stanford, Samford, and not Samford and Son. Um, four, 42 points is a school record in one half for Florida. So, I, as I wrote today, uh, Dan Mullen has at least these last two games left. Then he will be reevaluated. He will not be fired midseason. Like uh, how many is it now? I think five or six have been fired. Justin Fuente was the latest today at Virginia Tech. So this has got all kinds of intrigue, and it's a great time for Missouri to be playing Florida, frankly, um, you know, because they, they come in distracted, not playing well defensively, and um, ready to be beat, in my opinion. Tigers have won two of their last three with the uh, only loss to uh, number one, Georgia. Seems like after a couple of blowouts early in the season, they, they have turned it around. What do you, where do you see the uh, status of the program right now? Um, you know, just got to get better defensively. You know, that uh, the performance earlier in the year was not good. Uh, the performance on uh, Tennessee, the performance against uh, A&M was not good. And, you know, you got to get guys lined up right. I mean, I, I can't speak for the talent because I don't know the talent, but it helps to line up right. And in a league now that is getting back to basics, Georgia has a generational offense within its own division. Uh, you know, best offense looks like statistically in about 20 years, going back to some of those Miami and, and uh, Alabama defenses in the 90s. Uh, you know, that's not going away. And there's been a general trend towards that this year, despite the last time I checked, I think this is set to be a record year for pa average passing yards um, and accuracy. But despite that, I think we've seen maybe just anecdotally defenses have kind of figured out the spread. I know that's a broad statement, but you can kind of see it. You see it with the chiefs. Um, they struggled mightily earlier in the season when people dropped eight on them. Um, and, I, and I think defenses have kind of figured out the spread to, to a certain extent. So now it's up to these offensive coaches to answer back, to adjust. Um, and that doesn't answer the Missouri the question about Missouri's defense, but I think it has something to do with it. Well, good news. Tigers held South Carolina 250 total yards. I mean, the Gamecocks are not a juggernaut, but, um, but it was a good effort. And they only gave up 57 yards rushing and forced three turnovers. Uh, Junior Isaiah McGuire was named the SEC yeah. Defensive Lineman of the Week. So real progress, I thought, last week and with a defensive score as well. Yeah, I agree. Um, and that was a game Missouri needed against South Carolina. Uh, Shane Beamer's done a great job. They're five and five in his first year. And he, he's never been he's never been a coordinator, um, you know, much less a head coach. And to, for him to win five games in year one, in the SEC is something. Now his name is going to come up 
immediately at Virginia Tech, where uh, Justin Fuente, as I mentioned, was fired today. His father, Frank Beamer, we all know about, coached there for, what, 27 years. I suspect he'll try to get that job. But if you know, I were him, it's almost, he's the same as a lot of coaches. You've got to go to a place and establish your, your credentials before you make that big jump. And I think that's the case. That's the case with him. Uh, you've really been churning out the stories this morning on uh, cbssports.com. I encourage all of our viewers to check it out. A lot of stuff about coaching changes. I do not recall a season where so many coaches were fired early or mid-season. And you're talking about jobs like USC, LSU, as you mentioned, Virginia Tech. Do you recall any kind of uh, flurry of firings like we've seen this year? Well, I, I looked at, I was the same way, Mark, and I looked it up. I get my notes here. There have now been uh, 12, only 12 uh, openings this year. Um, there were 18 last year. In 2019, there were 27. Uh, seven, of the, seven of the 12 have been power five jobs. Um, you know, two of them are really top 20 jobs, you know, LSU and, and uh, USC. The last time there was that many was 2017. We had three such openings, LSU, Oklahoma, and Texas. But I, I think the biggest, the biggest note is that since 2016, 48 of the 65 power five schools of which Missouri has won have changed coaches at least once. That's 73 quarters of the, co of, the, uh, of the schools. 21 of those have changed coaches more than once. Baylor's changed three times for obvious reasons. Art Bryles to Jim Groh to Matt Rule to, um, to Dave Aranda right now. So this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, the phenomenon of firing within the season, yes. I think, I think this makes it now five or six. I want to say six coaches have been let go this year in the middle of the season. Um, and, and it's really a reaction, as I said in the story, to uh, you know, the, the transfer portal where players, it's, it, it is free agency. You can go in and out anytime they want, one time in their career. And then this early signing period, ADs are always reacting to that. December 15th is that date. So that's less than a month away. And I think that's why you saw, saw Virginia Tech do what it did. Um, that's why if Florida makes a change, you're going to see them probably, you know, react to that Sunday after the Florida state game in a couple of weeks, uh, if they do anything. So yeah, it, you know, if, if you don't have things lined up, uh, in the portal and early signing period wise, you're in big, big trouble, or at least that's the perception from these ADs and, and they're, they're willing to eat all this buyout money as well. Talking to Dennis Dodd of CBS Sports. Dennis has been with CBS since 1998, former president of football writers. And you are one of only seven people to cover all 16 BCS title games. That's quite a distinction. Yeah, I mean, as Woody Allen once said, that 85% of life is just showing up. So I guess that's, that's, my, that's my distinction. <laughs> and five, five of the seven uh, playoffs um, didn't go last year because of COVID. And then in 15, my wife was having surgery. So that was, that was out. So whatever that is, 21 out of 23. So um, yeah, the, the playoff thing fascinates me because it's going, it looks like it's going to expand. And that means more opportunities for really the SEC, which is the best conference is going to be able to get more teams in. Uh, but there's been tremendous infighting about what that's going to look like. Uh, the Pac-12 and Big Ten, which favor the Rose Bowl, are trying to get their traditional teams at their traditional time within that structure. They're being fought against that. There's an alliance, as a lot of you probably know, between the ACC, Big Ten, and Pac-12, which are railing against the, the SEC ever since July 21st, when word, word leaked about the Texas-Oklahoma exodus to the SEC. So, there's not a lot of unity right now. If you thought there wasn't much unity last year during COVID when we had, you know, some schools starting, some schools not starting, some conferences, um, the way they dealt with COVID, this, is, this makes that look like uh, uh, kindergarten because um, they're supposed to meet again December 1st. Uh, we might have this playoff, guys and girls, for the next, what, five years to the end of the contract. So it's not going to change anytime soon. If you'd like to ask Dennis a question, please use the chat feature at the bottom of the screen. Dennis, uh, another team I want to ask you about, and you mentioned Texas going to the SEC. 
shocking result on Saturday. I thought KU <laughs> upsetting Texas in, in, in his first season. Is Steve Sarkeesian on the hot seat? He's definitely on the hot seat. I mean, I you know I, I don't think they're going to part ways with him after one season. But when you lose to Kansas and it, you know a one and eight team that hadn't won a road conference game in thirteen years, I re I remember writing that I said Kansas. The Kansas seniors were in third grade the last time Kansas won a, uh, a road conference game. And I even texted Mark Mangino. I said, congratulations, you're off the hot seat. You know, you're not the last guy to, to win a road conference game. Um, yeah, and then to give up 57 points doing it uh, in the space of, what was it, I think 63 seconds or something like that. Late in the second quarter, Kansas scored three touchdowns on turnovers and whatnot. So it, it, it was bad. I mean, there's, look, they fired Charlie Strong, uh, what was it, in 16 after he lost to KU. Tom Herman was fired after he went seven and three in the, uh, last year. And now Steve Sarkeesian is four and six, needs to win the last two to get to a bowl. It hasn't worked out now. I don't know if it will work out, but, you know, there, there are people way beyond Steve Sarkeesian and the AD Chris Del Conte that will decide this. You know, that those people took a run at Nick Saban a few years ago and that didn't work. I guess they figured his play caller would be the next best thing, which he was. I'm not going to disparage Steve Sarkeesian. He, he was the hottest name available last, last week, last year. Um, and good for him that he got the job. And it's not to say he can't succeed, but it's not a good time right now. Can Texas come up with the money to, to pay him out at this point or? Well, they just paid um, uh, Tom Herman $15 million, uh, combined with the assistance and buyout money. Combined with the assistance, that figure was over 20. They would owe Sar uh, Steve Sarkeesian 20. Uh, never say never with Texas. You know, money, when, when they want to do something, money isn't an object. But I, I just think they'd go beyond the one year with him and see how he does. But there's another point to this that if Texas is, thinks it's going to get well in, uh, in the SEC, they've got another thing coming. You, you don't go there in the middle of rehabbing your program and expect to get better. Um, I said it's like taking a Prius to the, the Indy 500. You know, you, you inject yourself into the SEC. It's not going to go well. Same with Oklahoma. Oklahoma is not going to win six straight conference titles like they have in the Big 12, maybe seven this year. Um, in, in the SEC, it's just not going to happen. Um, so if they, those two schools expect to get better at football in the SEC, they got another thing coming. More money, I don't know if the success is better. What do you think of how the uh, Big 12 will turn out with its additions? Will it still I be? Think they, yeah, I think they did as good as they, as good as they could. Uh, they went and got those schools that they, you know, rejected in 2016 and that that aborted uh expansion move uh and they looked a lot more attractive this time because they needed bodies and so it it's really kind of sneaky good in basketball because think about this think about the teams you got in there houston just went to the final four cincinnati's traditionally good byu is the second best team um you know in that league that competes with uh they compete with gonzaga i think in the big west is that it I'm not sure. Um, they have the second biggest college arena in the country next to Kentucky, the Marriott Center, 23,000 seats, I think it is. So it, for, for any you know, traditional um, Big 12 team going up there, it's going to be uh, an eye opener for them and basketball and football. They turned it around under Kalani Sataki, whose, whose name has come up with some of these jobs. He's, he's a former BYU player. He's got it turned around. They won 11 last year. They're doing well this year. I think they're eight and two, nine and two. Uh, so it's a, gr a great addition. Um, as long as Luke Fickle's at Cincinnati. I think the big thing with the Big 12 in, in expansion is there's an opportunity for someone or some group of teams to become the dominant program. Because if I look at those 12 teams, I can't tell you who's going to be the most dominant. You know, maybe, maybe Oklahoma State. Um, maybe Cincinnati, maybe uh, BYU. I don't know. I think it's going to be fascinating to see what emerges out of that. I want to jump to some questions because uh, several re related to coaching, or possible coaching changes. Rumor going around Lincoln Riley is headed to LSU. What do you think? Uh, Lincoln Riley's name popped up at, uh, yes, LSU. And I, I don't know how much credence to put into it, but 
I will tell you the thinking that um, with Texas now recruiting directly against Texas and A&M in the same conference, it's going to be harder. He recruits against them anyway, the way things are. But now, and, and to be fair, that's where Oklahoma gets the, you know, the lion's share of its players. But going back to uh, uh, Bud Wilkinson, they've always recruited Texas well. And, and frankly, look, LSU is a better job. LSU is a top five, top 20 job right now for sure, where, you know, uh, it's, it's harder to recruit at Oklahoma, if that makes any sense, than LSU. Because you, at LSU, Nick Saban proved when he went there in 2000 that you can get in your car and recruit. You know, you, you go to East Texas, you, you uh, erect a fence around the state, and you've got enough players to, uh, to compete nationally, to compete for national championships. And he, he did just that, winning one in four years later in 2003. So, yeah, I, I'm, I, I think that was Blackman, wasn't it? That was his question? Yep. Yes. Yeah, that, that's a good one because I, I have heard that. I, I haven't been able to put any, any credence to it. But think of that. That was a shocker if, uh, if Lincoln Riley would leave, leave Oklahoma for LSU. Paul always asks great questions. We yeah, he does. Him, so. Uh, who starts the coaching chains carousel? So who's going to make the first big hire of the big jobs that are open? And well, who as I mentioned, you know, it's, uh, it's LSU and USC and really there's no favorite there now for either of the, either of those schools. I think USC is waiting on Luke Fickle, uh, from Cincinnati, because as many of you know, their AD Mike Bone hired him at Cincinnati when he was there, Luke Fickle, the the former uh, Ohio State linebacker, Ohio State coach, Ohio State interim coach, Ohio State guy, uh, met his wife at school. They have six children, very rooted to the Cincinnati area. But can he be convinced to come to a top five job like USC? Um, kind, kind of the same at LSU. I do think at LSU, I really like Mel Tucker, the Michigan State coach to go there. He's got, he's got tremendous SEC ties. He was... Um, he was defensive coordinator at both Georgia and Alabama, been in the NFL, was at LSU for one year under Nick Saban, coaching defensive backs in 2000, and now has Michigan State in a situation where they could win the Big 12. They, lost, you know, they, they beat Michigan in that game. Um, they lost to Purdue, but they still control their own destiny in the, uh, in, the, in the Big 10 East. And he's a good guy. I spent some time with him a couple of weeks ago the weekend of the Michigan game. I, I, he's, he's a really, really good coach um, and would be good for LSU, but none of that's for certain that the wild card here who has kind of dropped out is uh, James Franklin from Penn state, who was the hot candidate. And by all measures, once out of Penn state, he doesn't like it. His wife doesn't like it. Not saying that publicly, but that's just what you hear. And he uh, he's gone six and four. So I don't know. That's going to be a tough sell at both LSU and USC if James Franklin goes seven and five. And, you know, I think his record against top, is it top 10 or top 20? Top 10 teams is something now like, uh, you know, three and 10 or something like that. So that's not very good. So yeah, I think he'd be a tough sell at either one right now. I encourage all our viewers to go to cbssports.com. Dennis has two stories he just posted this morning about the coaching carousel. And they're very, very interesting. and well-researched as they, as you always do a great job. Hey, new CFP rankings will come out tonight. Um, last week, it was Georgia, Alabama, Oregon, and Ohio state yeah. in your rankings. You have Cincinnati number two. I'm having struggling with why Cincinnati in the top four, because Oregon lost to a three and seven Stanford team. Now they do right. have a win over Ohio state, Alabama lost to a three loss A&M team what does Cincinnati have to do? I know their schedule's not as strong, but you can only beat who you play. Yeah, I, I like Cincinnati because, and I've had them in the top four sort of since this thing started, uh, the ranking started. I like Cincinnati because they've done something no one else has done. And you're right, Mark, you can only play who you play. Their, their overall strength of schedule is not good, but, but you know what? Uh, until Michigan State started playing Michigan, neither was, uh, neither was Michigan State. But that's another story. Cincinnati play, went and got uh, two Power Five teams to play in back-to-back -back games on the road. This, these games were scheduled at Indiana, at Notre Dame. Now, I, I will 
I will give you that Indiana is not very good this week, but what do they tell you in the NCAA tournament? You got to get, go get teams and then beat them. So they went out and got these teams. I would suggest try to find me a team that's uh, gone on the road to play two power fives, one, both one in the top 10. And as I said, both on the road, I, I don't know of a team, um, you know, in non-conference play that has done that. So there's that. And as long as Notre Dame keeps winning, they're nine and one, that's going to look good for Cincinnati. Um, and they, they've handled everybody else. And then the final point, there's only three uh, unbeaten teams left. That's got to start meaning something with two weeks left in the season, Georgia, Cincinnati, and then UTSA, uh, which is not in the top 10. It's not definitely not in the top 10 in, in the college football playoff ranking. So Again, having watched Cincinnati play, I don't think uh, their level of play is that much different than the teams they're chasing. And you're right. Uh, Oregon, in, in a down Pac-12, lost to a 3-7 and seven Stanford. Ohio, or ironically enough, Ohio, Ohio State would now make part of its case on, hey, we lost to Oregon. That's a good loss. Um, and if they finish ahead of Ohio State, there's going to be holy hell on the West Coast because of that head-to-head. -head. But you already see... Uh, the selection committee has already ranked Michigan ahead of Michigan State. And I tell you what, having seen them both play, I think Michigan's better despite the head-to-head. -head. I know that sounds weird, but that's the way I feel. You're off this week to cover Michigan State, Ohio State. Um, and that's in Columbus, right? That's right. So yeah. uh, what, what do you think of that game? Did Michigan State pull it off? Well, the problem with Michigan State is, uh, and I, I realize this, a couple of weeks ago when I saw them play Michigan at the time they had the big Ten's worst pass defense and it showed Cade McNamara threw for a career high 383 in that game combined Michigan had over 400 yards passing it got worse there if, if they, they were the the worst pass defense in the country number 130 and I suspect they're around that right now they gave up a bunch of yards in that loss to Purdue uh, a couple of weeks ago 40 to 21 so you combine that with going on the road against C.J. Stroud, uh, the quarterback at Ohio State, who now may be the Heisman front runner. You know, things are kind of playing out. And it looks, it looks like for the fifth consecutive year, th this, is, this stood out to me, too, for the fifth consecutive year, an Ohio State quarterback is going to lead the league in passing. Uh, Justin Fields was very good. But this goes back to J.T. Barrett. This goes back to when Urban Meyer was still there. And C.J. Stroud has had uh, in a fantastic rookie year. Not rookie, he's a redshirt freshman, but I think 30, I want to say 32 touchdowns, five interceptions. And I met the kid uh, this summer at a camp in California, and he's, he's great, uh, great kid. And so I think all that put together against a set of receivers, Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave, some of the best in the country. That's going to be a tough ask. Michigan State's going to have to slow the game down with Kenneth Walker, the third, the leading rusher uh, in the country, and try to just do time of possession, you know, kind of like what Baylor did to Oklahoma last week. I'm going to ask you, he's not going to get any Heisman mentioned, but Tyler Beatty of Missouri is putting together yeah. a, a historic season, certainly by school standards, fourth in the nation in rushing, fourth in all purpose, tied for six in touchdowns. Um, he said quite a year, may break the Mizzou single season rushing record. Yeah, he has. And that was, that's a credit to him. That's a credit to, to coach drink uh, for developing him and leaning on him. Another guy I, I wanted to mention before we got off is Rashad white. Now you probably don't know who Rashad white is. He's uh, the leading rusher at Arizona state, one of the leading rushers in the country. And he's from center high school in Kansas city where he had a record breaking career while he was there. He just went for, I'm looking it up. 263 yards in total offense or all-purpose yards against Washington last week in the rain. So, that, and he's gotten to the point where he's got another year of eligibility, uh, but he's not going to be around. He's he's too good for the NFL. He, he I, I saw him in person a couple of weeks ago against USC, and he's just he's an amazing uh, cutback and runner that he really gets going in the second level. So, a homeboy from Kansas City, Rashad White. I don't. I don't know who the coach is at center, uh, but he deserves a lot of credit. This guy's really good. Um, 
you, uh, I wanted to talk to you uh, in your early days as a young reporter. You covered uh, Mizzou and Coach Warren Powers. Warren passed away a couple weeks ago. In fact, his services are tomorrow uh, in St. Louis. So, uh, what, what are your memories of covering Warren? Yeah, un underrated as uh, as a coach at Mizzou. You have to put all this in historical perspective. When he was going seven and four, eight and four at Missouri, it just seemed like it was never enough. But you know, he, he had some upsets there that were amazing. I think he was the coach in that he was in the 78 opener. He was they walked into Notre Dame. That was his first game. First and it, game. I was my first game working in the athletic department. Yeah. yeah. Defending national champs, Joe Montana and Missouri wins three to nothing. Uh, one of the, the, the best, greatest results in, in Mizzou history. Um, developed Phil Bradley, Kellen Winslow. Um, a bunch of great defensive players. Um, uh, the, the Sykeston train, uh, James, I'm forgetting his name. James Wilder. James Wilder, the great James Wilder was all under, was all under uh, Warren Powers. And he deserves a lot of credit. I'll tell you what, as he, as he became ill and, and aged, you, you started to hear the respect he had. You know, guys would say, hey, do you hear about Warren Powers? Not doing too well. Uh, he was well respected, a gentleman, and uh, really deserves, you know, a place in in Mizzou history for what he did. He had one losing season in seven, and he went to bowl games when it really yep. meant something to go to bowl games. Five yep. of them, so yeah, great career. And I always the Nebraska. Uh, you mentioned the Notre Dame game at the beginning of that season, the, the last game of the regular oh. season. They upset at Nebraska 35-31 yes. where James Wilder ran like a freight train. Was I'll, ne I'll never forget that. Do you remember him throwing the safety to the ground oh, yeah. near, the, near the goal line? And yeah. that was, it, yeah, that was amazing. That was while I was in school. So I have fond memories of that. I have memories of James Wilder coming into the Missourian office. And, and it, you Back then, AP was a, was a ticker where it would just print out stories on a giant typewriter. That's how he found out uh, where and how he was drafted, you know, the Chargers. He was in there, in there reading it. There was no TV that covered the draft back then. That's great. That's great. Uh, back to the current uh, season, uh, Georgia, are they in a class by themselves? Can they be beat? Uh, that's interesting. I, right now, I would say no. Um, they, Jordan, the defense, again, is generational. Uh, Jordan Davis, their nose guard, may have less than 10 tackles on the season, but he's going to be the defensive player of the year because of his ability to wreck offensive lines and take on double teams, take up two blockers. The best story there to me is their quarterback, uh, Stetson Bennett the fourth. He sounds like uh, somebody in a fraternity class. Uh, <laughs> the guy that greets you at the door, grab a beer, don't cost nothing. Uh, <laughs> but he... He came as a walk-on, left for a junior college, came back as a walk-on, through a series of injuries, became the starting quarterback, and now is, last week, was named to the semifinalist list of the Unitas Award, I whatever it is, I think there's 20 semifinalists, and for a guy that, in that offense, hasn't completed until Saturday more than 14 passes in a game, he's become more than a game manager, he's become a weapon, you know, for a team that had a lot of injuries in the beginning, particularly at receiver and in the secondary. I was at the Clemson game to start the season, and they were playing. They had a walk-on in the secondary against Clemson. Um, and so now you, you see what they've done. They're just mashing teams. I think the number was they had given up 59 uh, points through nine games, and that was the fewest or third fewest in 20 years or something like that. Um, and Tennessee scored what 17 on them so that was huge but yeah it's going to be hard uh, you know the, the game not the game of the year but one of them will be that SEC championship game where uh, George is going to be favored but if Alabama wins then you know the SEC is probably going to get two teams in the playoff in other words Georgia goes into that SEC title game for seeding you know there's nothing they can do not to get in the playoff that day. So it's been, it's been a great year for, uh, for the dogs. I always want to call, call that quarterback Thurston Howell the third, but uh, it's right. <laughs> hear that. So oh, yeah. uh, let's, let's move to a few questions and folks, uh, we only got Dennis for about 15 more minutes. He's got a, a commitment to keep. So um, are there enough 
applicants for the top openings. And I think you touched on this in your yeah. story this morning. Yeah, that's what I wrote about. There aren't. Um, uh, to put it briefly, you know, the best guys are either retired, have jobs, have analyst jobs, or aren't interested. I mean, Nick Saban's not coming to any of these jobs. I, I don't know about Bob Stoops. You know, I don't know about Chris Peterson. I, I just saw Bob at, uh, at the Baylor game over the weekend. He seemed pretty happy. Um, and if he's going anywhere, I think it would probably be a USC, but I'm not sure. You know, I, you know, he, I think he'd come back to a place like Ohio State or, or Florida, frankly, or, Ohio, or uh, Notre Dame where it was set up to win. But, you know, those jobs aren't open right now. So, uh, and I, as I mentioned, there's been, what, what did I say? There have been 72, since 2016, 72 Power Five job changes. Um, not all those were, you know, some of those were more than once. That's a lot. Um, you know, so there's just not, you know, they're going to have to take some chances on guys, guys coming up. Uh, you know, uh, Justin Fuente, watch for Luke Fickle at Justin at, uh, at Virginia Tech. You know, I, I think they've got a better program. They got a better recruiting base, um, got a better chance of, uh, of winning uh, in the wide open ACC right now. So everybody wants to talk about him going elsewhere. Uh, Virginia Tech might be uh, might be a landing spot for him. So the the big names there just aren't many of those to go around. Urban's in the NFL for the time being. Is there a guy outside of the Power Five? We talked about Luke Fickle, of course, and a great job he's done at Cincinnati. Is there a guy outside of the Power Five uh, conferences or a coordinator that we don't know much about who could grab one of these big jobs? Yeah, uh, Jay Norvell at. Um, at Nevada. He's eight and two this year. It's the second time since 2012, they've started a season that well. They've got a quarterback who's probably going to be drafted in the first round, Carson Strong. He's done well there in, uh, I think, five or six years. Well, I, I think it, at the time he was fired by Bob Stoops about the same time Josh Heupel was. He was a co-coordinator at Oklahoma and went to Nevada and, and basically re remade himself. Um, great reputation in the coaching community. His name will has popped up at both Washington and Washington State, uh, but I think he could, he could coach anywhere and he's still young enough as well. He is not related to Mike Norvell, is he? Uh, he's not, no, he's not. not so. um, another name question came up, how about Dave Dorn from North Carolina State? Is he you see him yeah he go he blows hot and cold i mean i see his name come up every year at for jobs at north carolina state and then they go eight and four or something like that um they were until last week they were in the running in the acc and they, they've had a really good year with devin leary the quarterback his name has come up for uh, i think every time this kansas job has been open in the, in the last 10 years and for whatever reason it just hasn't worked out but yeah, I, I think he I think he expected to be gone from NC State before now, but that's not the you know disparage the job he's done. In fact, they've won. I think they've already won eight games um, there this year. So yeah, he he's a homeboy. He's from uh, what is Overland Park, I think, right? I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts about NIL so far? I think it's uh, I think it's worked. I think there's been absolutely no impact on the game, uh, despite, you know, what the, the NCA said, the sky would fall since July 1st. It's, you know, I, I don't even think about it anymore. The only time I, I, you know, it really impacted me. It was number one, BYU had a situation where, um, they, uh, had a, a booster who owned an energy bar company and he funded all the walk-on, um, scholarships. So basically BYU has 120, the players on scholarship. Now that could be a problem going forward if other schools decide to do that. And there's nothing the NCAA can do about it. Uh, when Spencer Rattler lost his starting job at Oklahoma, I called the car dealer that had given him two cars, not one, but two. And I said, does this make any difference in your investment? And he basically said, no, it's still free advertising. We contribute to OU athletics. We're proud, proud boosters. And then he, the key point, the key point, I said, you know, who pays for those cars? You, well, he has to give them back in January. Okay. So what they are, are basically leases. And we've all, we've all shopped at car dealers. Hey, you got any demos where someone else has driven the car and you get it for a few dollars less? 
So they're, get, they're getting the return on the investment. And they can even say, hey, Spencer Rattler, NFL quarterback, once drove this car. And so they're not giving them cars. They're loaning them cars. They're, they're giving them cars without lease payments um, and still turning around and selling them later. So I do not have a big problem with it. I think the game has flourished, frankly, with it. Some questions on Mizzou. How much is Tyler Beatty hamstrung in terms of acclaim and honors by playing for a mediocre team? Uh, same as the guy I mentioned, uh, Rashad White at uh, at Arizona State. If you're not ten and two or eleven and one and competing for a championship, you're you're not going to be uh, at least for the Heisman. I should mention. Look, there's a Doak Walker Award that recognizes the best running back, and obviously that's going to go to the Michigan State guy. The best receiver award, the Belitnikov, United Award for quarterback. But yeah, it, it it does. I mean, winning helps. I mean, there's there's no question about that. Um, and when you don't play for a team that's winning big, it, it's going to impact you. You know, there's not many Paul, Paul Hornings around where he won the Heisman in 56, I want to say, with a sub 500 team at Notre Dame. That's not happening anymore. Uh, issues at Mizzou on the quarterback. Who, who do you think gets the nod this week? And who do you think will be the starter next season? I, I lean on my, uh, my niece is a, uh, is a videographer there and she's much closer to, to that than me. I ended up texting her that very question last week. Um, and she said, she said, you know, they're almost ready to move on past Basilac. So I don't know if I've seen enough of it to offer an opinion, but uh, they're, the way they've recruited, my goodness, this, this receiver from East St. Louis, uh, you know, let's hope he's not another uh, Doriel Green Beckham because uh, let's ho hope he's more of a, uh, you know, uh, Jeremy you know, Macklin. Yeah, right. Um, from the past. So uh, they're recruiting great. I mean, I can't wait to see how this pans out. Um, and they've still got everything in front of them. I think, like I said, I still think they have a great chance to finish out and win these next two games. Well, that leads to one of our next question. Uh, it sounds like you're still bullish on Le Eli Drinkwitz long term. Yeah, I am. I am. Um, you know, who knows which way. The East is going to go um, again. He's recruiting well. Got to get better defensively. Uh, but you know the way the they, you know they get Tennessee and Florida at home every other year. Um, they get Georgia at home every other year. Those are opportunities. I don't think those are you know those are uh, drawbacks to being in the SEC. And, then, and Missouri's proved under Gary Pinkle they can do it. And who knows which way Florida's headed now. So it may come back to them a little bit. I'm, I'm still very bullish. I want to wrap up asking you know, your thoughts on give you three games this weekend that I thought were kind of intriguing. Arkansas, Alabama. Uh, Arkansas has really improved this year. Can they get the upset? Yeah, I, that is a big one this week. Um, Sam Pittman, if he wins this one, they're going to build a statue of him in, of him in year two at Arkansas. I think there's too much uh, firepower at Alabama. They've... Um, their offensive line hasn't played very well. Uh, Bryce Young has saved them uh, because of his mobility, but the, the offensive line doesn't play well. Uh, the defense hasn't been what it was in last year, but it never was going to be because of all the players they lost. Will Anderson Jr., the linebacker, maybe is going to be an All-American consensus All-American. He's great. I don't know in this game if, if Arkansas has a, enough playmakers. So I'd have to pick Alabama. Okay. Well, I hope Alabama wins and uh, it's very physical and Arkansas is hurting next week when they play. Is right. It... Exactly. Beat them up a little bit. Um, next question. Do you think attendance at college games will increase after we get through the pandemic or are people too used to watching on TV? Well, there's a profound attendance problem in college football. And that was before the pandemic. Uh, I remember, remember writing a story that February of 20 before it hit. Um, the SEC had had its worst average attendance since 93. The Pac-12 had its worst average attendance since they started keeping statistics in 1978. And it's, it's the same old issues. It's, it's easier to stay at home, not fight parking, not pay for parking, not pay exorbitant prices for concessions. You got a big screen HD TV with a cooler next to you. Um, you know, with the guy in front of you not standing up and blocking your view. And so I, I don't know how, how they get by that. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're trying, the schools are trying to make the experience more like the home experience, club seating, um, you know, waiters and waitresses in some of these places, but not everybody can do that. 
there's a lot of people that still sit on on metal benches um, in those stadiums. So it is a problem. The ADs know it's a problem, but they're trying to address it. A couple other games this weekend: Oregon, Utah. What do you think? Uh, this is this may be Oregon's Waterloo. Um, this is going to be the biggest challenge on their schedule down the stretch because it's at Utah. Utah is playing very very well and still has a chance to win the South. Uh, they're the most physical team. Still might be the most physical team in the Pac-12 under Kyle Whittingham. Um, and I think I ended up picking Utah. I think this is going to be hard, especially Anthony Brown, the quarterback, who's basically basically been massaged through this season. He's not a great thrower. Um, he's a serviceable runner. But Joe Moorhead, the uh, athletic, uh, the offensive coordinator, has done a great job with him. But I, I, I think it's too much for Oregon this week. They're, they're out of the playoff run if they lose that. And that could be a, a rematch in the Pac-12. Absolutely uh, could be, yeah. Uh, the last one is local uh, Baylor K State. K State's had a very very nice season. Baylor coming off the upset Oklahoma. Maybe K State catches them on a down week. Yeah, you're, that's what you worry about if you're Baylor. They were at an all time high against Oklahoma. As I said, I was there. Abram Smith, thousand yard rusher. Uh, Gary Bohannon is a very very physical player at quarterback. Both of those guys are former linebackers. Abram Smith, one of the leading rushers in the country played four games at linebacker last year that shows you how far they've come back Dave Aranda's one of the great young coaches in the country uh they will play defense they will limit Kansas State as they did Oklahoma to their worst showing yardage wise the Lincoln Miley era fewest points by Oklahoma since the 2014 Russell Athletic Bowl uh and that's what Kansas State's running into and we know that that Oklahoma has elite offensive players big challenge for Skylar Thompson and the Wildcats Dennis, you're the best. Uh, I think I could ask you about the four string tackle on uh, Middle Tennessee State. You'd know who it is, but I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you very much. I know you got to get going. Uh, we always appreciate seeing you every year and uh, look forward maybe next time to see you in person. All right. Thanks so much, guys. All right. Hey, thanks everybody for watching today. Uh, next week, we'll have Mike DeCourcy, who's the, the basketball writer from Sporting News, who we've had about every year. And he uh, always has a wealth of knowledge, so we'll be talking some hoops next week. In two weeks, John Sunbold, Mizzou legend, Hall of Famer. And then in three weeks, football recru recruiting guru, Danny Heidert out of St. Louis. We'll talk this right before signing date. So everybody, thanks for checking in. Again, go to the website, kctigerclub.com for membership and other information, and we will see you in a week. Take care.